Landing a plane. It's harder than it sounds. I mean, just think about it. You're cruising along in the sky, needing to locate some concrete slab 40,000 feet below you, about the width of a hair. Oh, and also there's a bunch of clouds in your way. So how do you get from here to here? Now in this video, I'll be breaking down the descent and landing phases of a flight by breaking it down into three main components. First are the systems involved in guiding the plane to the right places with shocking precision, including some autopilot and auto land systems that can even land the aircraft entirely on its own. Second, I'll tell you a little bit about how runways are designed, including the mysterious numbering system from which they're named. And lastly, I'll talk about the physics of how to actually land a plane and the flight control surfaces that pilots use to provide you the illusion of these 100 ton metal chunks gliding gracefully onto the runway like a feather. And along the way, I'll also answer some of your passenger FAQs, including why do engines get momentarily louder right after landing, and why do hard landings happen anyway? I mean, aside from the fact that you're flying Ryanair. So in this video, I'll give you a few reasons as to why maybe the next time your plane lands, you should be clapping after all. So let's get started. Thanks to CuriosityStream for sponsoring this video. For access to thousands of documentaries and my video streaming service, Nebula, check out the link in the description. So how does the plane actually find the runway from 40,000 feet in the air? Well, very simply put, it relies on a series of radio navigation systems from the airports to guide it there. In the early years of commercial flights, a VOR system was used, standing for a very high frequency omnidirectional range radio beacon that emits a signal to the surrounding area. Then aircraft in the nearby airspace containing the right receiver on board can receive the signal and locate where it's coming from. Now VORs rely on two signals to find the aircraft position. The first is a directional signal that rotates clockwise 30 times a second to determine the angle of the aircraft's position. And a second reference signal is sent in all directions to measure the distance to the aircraft. Now unfortunately, the system will only tell pilots where the plane is laterally and does not provide any vertical guidance. In other words, how high off the ground the plane actually should be. Now, the aim of this system is to get the plane close enough to the airport that the pilot can spot the runway and land visually. And the minimum height at which this needs to happen is also known as decision height or decision altitude. And when pilots reach this decision point, they need to be able to see the runway in order to continue with the approach. If not, then they must prepare to climb again and perform a go around. Now, this is such an important point that some aircraft like the Boeing 747 have a robotic voice yelling decide to remind pilots. Decide. Now, if I had that voice next to me every time I needed to pick a place for dinner, decide, decide, decide. I would have saved years off my life. Now, over time, a more precise version of VORs was created, and that is also known as the Instrument Landing System, or ILS, that is used by basically every single airliner in the world today. Now, the ILS consists of two directional radio signals, the localizer, which provides horizontal guidance, and the glide scope, which provides vertical guidance. Now, the localizer will emit two signals with different frequency, 90 Hz for the right side of the runway and 150 Hz for the left side, both overlapping exactly at the runway centerline. Now, it's easier to imagine the right side as emitting yellow beams of light and the left blue. So only when pilots are lined up exactly with the runway will they see both yellow and blue, making green. Otherwise, they will see only one color and will know that they need to move in the corresponding opposite direction to line up with the runway. Now, of course, pilots are not playing a game of literal air twister every time they need to land. Instead, instruments will interpret these radio signals and display the aircraft position on the localizer indicator. The pilot simply needs to line up the needle to the center line. 
and the exact same system is used for the glide slope, except it's flipped sideways and tilted to match the desired angle of descent, which is usually around 3 degrees. And ILS is so precise that some systems allow the plane to be landed only using autopilot, requiring no pilot intervention. This is also known as a Cat 3C or 00 landing. Now, of course, this has very strict requirements not only for the ground radar systems, but for the pilots monitoring the system as well. So in reality, this system is very rarely used, accounting for just 1% of all landings, except in the case of extremely bad visibility. So in most other cases, ILS will only get the plane to a decision height, where the pilot will need to take over and land manually. And the more precise this ground radar system is, or in other words, more expensive, the lower this decision height can be. Now, this is essentially the difference between CATS 1, 2, and 3 category landings. And for the last manual portion of landing, the pilot only needs to worry about maintaining the descent rate, since the plane should already be laterally lined up with the runway. Now, for this, the pilot will rely on a series of lights called the Precision Approach Path Indicators, or PEPI to ensure they're approaching at the right angle. And although almost every single airliner today uses ILS, the system does have some limitations. For example, ILS requires the plane to be lined up with the runway for a pretty long distance, which works pretty well for flat lands, but doesn't work very well for airports surrounded by hills. It's also not so accessible for small airports with limited budgets. So if ILS is not available, pilots may use alternative methods, such as area navigation navigation, or RNAV, which uses a series of GPS waypoints to line the plane up laterally with the runway. Now, these are just some of the many fancy technologies available today to help guide planes to the right places on the ground. Now, the runway is a supporting character that is often overlooked, but it's actually got some pretty nifty secrets of its own. For one, this might seem pretty obvious, but how does a pilot even know which runway to land at? Well, air traffic control will provide landing clearance for a specific runway. For example, one six, runway two, two left, clear to land. Runway 22 left in this case is the name of the runway, which you'll see labeled at each end. Well, actually, I hope you don't see it, because if you can see the runway numbers on a commercial flight without physically flying the plane yourself, then something is horribly uh wrong. But runways are not named after the lucky numbers of the air traffic controllers, but in fact are given numbers that correspond to its compass bearing. In other words, it's essentially the angle that it makes clockwise from north. This angle is rounded to the nearest 10 degrees and the last zero is dropped. Hence, all runways will be named from 01 to 36. Now, each runway will have two names, one for each end. And since opposite ends of the same runway vary by 180 degrees, their names will always differ by 18. So next time, if you're told that you'll be taking off from runway 9, you know that the runway faces 90 degrees from north. In other words, you'll be flying due east. And since most large airports will have multiple runways that are parallel to one another, their runway numbers are typically followed by left, center, or right. And I suppose airports with four parallel runways are not allowed to exist. Now, of course, these numbers help make sure that the pilot is landing on the right runway, but they also help align the right heading so that the aircraft doesn't roll off the side after it lands. And in addition to these runway numbers, there are a few additional markings on the runways to help pilots land. You might see two white strips on the runway. Those are called the aiming point markings. And as its name implies, that's where the pilots aim to land. But just before the aiming points, there is also an area called the touchdown zone. Now this is where the plane will actually land. And it's typically reinforced with an extra thick layer of material underneath to absorb the impacts. Now, the two areas are different, not because pilots have bad aim, but because they need to flare the aircraft right before touching down, which I'll explain in detail later on. Now, you may not have noticed just looking at it, but runways are actually not perfectly smooth. They have grooves on them to prevent what is called hydroplaning, which is where a very thin layer of water between the tires and the ground will cause the aircraft to lose control. It's essentially an academic term for slipping. 
Now, depending on the budget and climate of major airports, typically runways will consist of asphalt or concrete, around 20 inches thick to accommodate even the largest jumbo jets. And runways at most large airports will be around two kilometers to four kilometers in length. And for our American friends, that's about 22 to 44 football fields. Now, it might not look like it, but slowing down a plane really is an art in and of itself, with a lot of moving parts involved. First, there are the secondary flight control surfaces like flaps. And if you've ever looked at the wings of an airplane during descent, you've probably seen flaps in action. These are surfaces on the trailing edge of the inner wing that extend outward during landings. Essentially, flaps will increase the surface area of the wing to generate more lift. Now, this allows the plane to stay in the air even when traveling at a lower airspeed. And as the plane starts approaching the runway, pilots can't just fly the plane into the ground. This would create tremendous loads on the landing gear and make for some not very happy passengers. Instead, pilots need to begin a flare by raising the nose of the aircraft. Now this forces the plane to slow down and create less and less lift until it eventually stalls right above the ground. And flare in the aircraft is crucial but very difficult to get right. Flare too soon and you'll stall way too high above the ground and come crashing down. But flare too late and you'll end up flying the plane into the ground with a very hard landing. Now, typically on general aviation aircraft, they should flare around 10 feet off the ground. But of course, for larger airliners like the Airbus A380, this becomes around 40 feet. And to help pilots anticipate the flare and landing, more sophisticated aircraft will call out the plane's distance above the ground around the last 100 feet or so. 50, 40, 30, 20, 10. And once the wheels touch the ground, a combination of different flight control surfaces are used to slow the aircraft to a stop. Now, if you look out onto a wing right after landing, you'll most likely see the spoilers being deployed. Now, these are slabs that sit on top of the surface of the wing that lift up to disturb the airflow around the top of the wing. This essentially destroys any lift that's still being created by the wings to prevent the plane from flying off the ground again. Now, spoilers differ from air brakes in that spoilers reduce lift while creating drag, whereas air brakes only create drag without having any effect on lift, but the two are commonly used together for landing. And most commercial airliners will use reverse thrust, which are mechanisms to help direct engine exhaust forward to create drag instead of thrust. This is also why after landing, you might hear the engines get louder momentarily. In the landing gear, you'll also find disc brakes that are pretty similar to brakes on cars. And for the super energetic planes, some might even require a parachute to slow down, like the ones used by the space shuttle to land. So guys, I hope you enjoyed this video all about how to land a plane. Do you think you'll be ready now to try one out yourself? Well, hopefully, at least the next time you're on a flight, you can catch some of the details I mentioned in this video in action. And if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to smash that like button and subscribe to my channel. And tell me in the comments down below, what was your most memorable landing, both for better or for worse? All right, now we've barely scratched the surface of the physics of flights, but if you're interested in learning more about different airplanes and want to support more independent creators like me, you should check out Nebula. It's an educational-ish video streaming platform where I'm joined by dozens of other females in STEM and fellow aviation creators like Real Engineering and Wenover Productions. I'm really happy to be a part of this platform where creators can experiment with our content without having to worry about demonetization or the algorithm. We've also partnered up with Curiosity Stream, a video platform with thousands of documentary films and TV series on everything from astrophysics to true crime. One of my new discoveries on Curiosity Stream is a new series called How to Build, and its first episode covered the ins and outs of how the wings of the A380 was designed. I mean, who would have thought there were so many secrets hidden inside a giant piece of metal? But if you enjoyed this video, that's one I'd highly recommend. From April 19th to the 25th, Curiosity Stream is giving our viewers a limited time offer of 41% off or just $12 a year for access to both Curiosity Stream and Nebula by using the promo code Jenny Ma. If that sounds good,
good to you, check out the link in the description. But that's it from me. Thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you next time.